I'm really excited about the opportunity to share a little bit about what's been happening. Um, and as you'll note from the title, it's, uh, it's a long history. So we're now um, in our 25th year. Um, but there's a lot of exciting things going on. So as we get started, I want to mention two quick disclosures. First, I'm president of a company that published a book about Boink, and second, I'm the PI on a contract from a commercial source. But to put some context on that, I've listed the folks that have contributed financially to Boink uh, since its beginning, and in bold here are some of the current uh, active sources. And you'll note that most of them are from federal agencies or other uh, nonprofit sources. I also wanted to start by introducing you to or showing you uh, the Loink team because they are awesome. I'm so uh, privileged to work with such an exceptional group. Um, they're a small team that really, really makes big things happen. And so all of what I'm talking about today is the result uh, of this group effort. Um, but scattered around, you might have noticed uh, our little sort of celebration cards. So we are now in our 25th uh, anniversary. And coincidentally, it just happens that uh, by the Chinese zodiac, it's the year of the pig, which is perfect because we've adopted the pig as our mascot because loink sounds like loink. Um, so we thought that that was a wonderful coincidence. Um, but we're crowning uh, for the first time loink day coming up. So February 16th, mark your calendars. Uh, we're hereby establishing our inaugural celebration of loink day because it was on this day back in 1994 that Clem uh, and Stanhoff and others got, to, got together to try to solve a fundamental problem. And what came out of that was LOINC, an integral standard for health data around the world. So I want to just sort of take you back really briefly to uh, when that all started. So it all started with Clem, uh, of course as many things do. So in the mid-90s, Clem was here after working successfully for a long time, building up electronic medical records and trying to integrate data in an HIE from multiple institutions. And what he realized is once you could get the electronic data flowing and he looked inside those data feeds, there was another bigger fundamental problem just from moving data around, looking across those different sources from different hospitals around central Indiana, the same task, the same measurement was given all sorts of different codes and identifiers that humans can look at and sort of make sense of, but for the computers trying to act on this information, it was a nightmare. And so rather than having everybody map to everybody else's codes for all the different people you wanted to share and exchange with, the real solution is to have a standard. And it was that idea, that formative idea, that started uh, Loink back in 1994 that LOINC could serve as this universal standard for tests, observations, and documents. But one of the innovations at the time was that this coding system would need to be developed at a level that had a, a precision to help distinguish between things that were clinically important, uh, rather than sort of billing or administrative code sets that had a higher level of granularity or a higher level of abstraction, meaning it didn't sort of account for clinical differences, this terminology was meant to serve that purpose of aggregating stuff um, and acting on it for the benefit of patients. So back in the early days, you can see sort of the flyer of advertising about what Blink is for and who it's, uh, it's good for. So data producers, data users, anybody who's trying to avoid this Tower of Babel uh, by aggregating uh, data points from multiple institutions uh, can use uh, Blink. So uh, for you young bloods, uh, this is what the internet used to look like. It's just <laughs> a page of text, a big long page of text. Uh, this is the long page from sort of 1999-ish. Uh, but there's an important second sentence in there which also illustrates what was different about Loink at the time. So unlike other coding systems, from the beginning, Loink was designed to be one that can be used with no license fee. And that opened uh, a, a wider door and a lower barrier of entry for using uh, this terminology standard. So we're going to zoom back uh, to the future now, to sort of present day. What is Link? So Link certainly is this collection, this database of uh, terms and identifiers for test measurements and observations, but it's also much more than that sort of artifact. Uh, each six months, we package up a release that contains a really rich set of implementation tools, including an online browser, a desktop application to help map local variables to one codes, 
uh, serving an API, uh, access to the terminology via the FHIR standard, uh, documentation, and so forth. But in addition to sort of that package, there's also this worldwide diverse community of Boink users. And it's that active community of use giving feedback to us as a curator of this who propel Boink's continuous uh, development. And so while on one hand, Boink is a database, it's a thing, it's also sort of all of these other aspects as well. So inside this database, there is a now, today, a rich collection, a trove of about 90,000 standardized variables that if you put on sort of your current day precision medicine hat, span that whole gamut down from the very, very detailed aspects of, of genetics and uh, molecular pathology testing up to the kinds of uh, clinical measurements that you're accustomed to seeing in EMRs, laboratory tests, for example, is what Link is famous for, clinical vital signs, but also document titles uh, such as progress notes, discharge summaries, radiology reports, we have a great collection now of about 5,000 of those, but also including variables uh, related to patient reported outcomes or standardized assessments, measures of activity, and even measures of sort of environmental factors where the unit of analysis might not be the patient but might be a community uh, or an institution. So this trove is sort of what, uh, what Link is sort of uh, known for. And my message to you is as you're thinking about whatever context you might apply this, if you've got data elements that you want to exchange with other people, think about uh, Link because we are obviously currently expanding all the time, but we have this sort of rich uh, trove that will help you avoid clinical battle. In this graph, I'll show you sort of the history of Link from that very first release published uh, back in 1995, all the way through our latest release that came out in uh, December. And one point to note, we're not done. <laughs> 25 years in, we keep growing, we keep adding, and as a relatively sort of straight climb up, the orange portion shows the number of terms that are uh, laboratory tests, and the blue portion represent other kinds of clinical measurements, uh, roughly sort of a two-third to one-third split, but you'll see in sort of the more recent years that that clinical portion is actually growing a little bit faster. Today, that worldwide community consists of about 74,000 registered users, meaning people who came to one website and made an account, uh, whose home addresses come from 175 uh, different countries. And uh, I want to give you just a tiny little taste of this. So get your passports ready. You're going to make the fastest trip around the world you've ever made. Uh, we'll start here in, uh, in the US with uh, sort of a sample of at the national level, the ONC, the Office of the National Coordinator for Health IT, uh, has done uh, some legislative things, published the certification criteria that um, electronic health record systems used by providers and hospitals need to conform to in order to get uh, the reimbursement incentives. And those criteria require one in a variety of different contexts. In addition, they published this thing that's called the Interoperability Standards Advisory that lists out the relevant standards for particular kinds of interoperability needs. And in that document, uh, LOINC is referred to and referenced for all these different sort of kinds of activities, including laboratory tests, which again, you might uh, sort of assume, but also uh, imaging studies, uh, nursing assessments, uh, social determinants and behavioral determinants of health, functional status, and a variety of other kinds of uh, clinical uh, measurements. And as the one example of sort of how federal agencies are making use of this, we've had interactions with, I don't actually remember, I have to look back, I'll say 15-ish to 20-ish different federal agencies that have something to do with health using LOINC. But take CDC, for example. When they want to uh, uh, pay attention to and surveil um, uh, pandemic flu or uh, Zika virus, they develop uh, strategies and testing algorithms for monitoring and tracking those things. And when they do that, they need uh, data coming from public health laboratories. And they express those rules, require those labs to send the data to them using one codes because they don't want to do all that mapping like I showed earlier. They want to be able to interpret and understand that data coming from multiple sources. All right, so we're going to jump on the, uh, the direct flight now from uh, Indy to Paris. And, but we're actually not going to stop in Paris. We could talk about what's happening in France or Italy or Spain or Portugal or uh, Austria or Belgium or Netherlands, but I'm just going to tell you a little bit about one sort of European-wide sort of initiative that is uh, commissioned by the uh, Europe, that's mandated by the European Commission to develop uh, an international patient summary. 
to support a particular use case, which is um, sort of an unscheduled care by somebody uh, in a different country, so cross-border care situation. What sort of minimum data set of information would you need to support decision making at that time? And this standard has been developed and is piloted and being rolled out uh, now, and it's adopted uh, going for identifying different kinds of the document type, for sections, for lab tests, for clinical observations, and radiology reports. And what that says is that the countries participating in this uh, need to be able to support this. So they're sort of all on board um, with making this sort of information available, and Mike plays a really key role in it. All right, so we're going to hop on our plane again and head out. Uh, we're not going to stop in Saudi Arabia, which actually has a one workshop going on this week, or uh, Qatar, but I want to just mention uh, Turkey, for example, uh, where the Ministry of Health there has mandated LOINC and its use in all of its uh, public uh, facilities, as well as uh, university and private facilities as well. And to help support that use, they curate a translation in Turkish and provide um, a linkage to the national billing codes, which everybody sort of has to have for reimbursement purposes. Having that bridge helps make it easier to implement uh, the standard. All right, heading out again. Uh, we're gonna head over to Southeast Asia. We're not gonna stop in China or Korea or Thailand, but we'll sort of make our descent into uh, Malaysia and uh, land there and talk with the folks at the Ministry of Health. And this is where the Health Informatics Committee uh, organized sort of the group of uh, pathologists who were responsible for the, <coughs> the national health system there, and by consensus reviewed uh, lungs coverage across a bunch of different areas and adopted it for use in all of the lab systems uh, within the country. In addition, they've been using LOINC at, uh, at the this project called the Malaysian Health Data Warehouse, which is a national uh, analytics uh, project. And so, all right, we're back here in Indiana. We could go on, it would be a lot of fun to talk uh, about many of these other sort of applications of LOINC, um, but I want to just mention two sort of things in, in closing about uses of LOINC, and that's sort of the interest or the growing interest from the big tech companies uh, in health. And uh, so last summer, um, this was a keynote talk given by Eyal, uh, who's a product manager at Google, specifically in the Google Brain um, uh, division, where he's showcasing the work that they've done on a, a platform called BigQuery, which is essentially a cloud data warehouse that has built in uh, really powerful machine learning uh, tools. And on the fly, he's demonstrating how he's running these, uh, these analytic uh, applications, and in this case, selecting uh, glucose uh, result values uh, across this large data set because the platform understands and recognizes sort of fire structure to organized data that's coded with LOINC. And while you can't see it uh, on the monitors here, you know, so inside that, his little query is referencing LOINC code for, uh, for glucose. But the second sort of big tech thing that I want to mention um, comes from Apple. So about two or three weeks ago, Apple CEO Tim Cook sat down with uh, Jim Cramer and gave a really interesting interview one of the most remarkable things, though, from that interview, from my perspective, is, uh, is this. He said that, I believe if you zoom out into the future and then look back uh, and you ask the question, what was Apple's greatest contribution to mankind, it will be about health. So let that sink in for a moment. He's saying that Apple's biggest contribution is going to be about health. Well, what the heck could that be about? Well, one of the things is this. So he went on to say, we are democratizing your medical records. We're taking what has been with the institution and empowering the individual to manage their health. And we're just at the front end of this. So they went on to sort of re-emphasize the point before and said, you know, but I do think looking back in the future, if you'll answer that question, Apple's most important contribution to mankind has been in health. Which is sort of crazy to me thinking about sort of personal computer stuff like the iPod and iTunes and the music industry and certainly smartphones. His perspective is that their greatest contribution is going to be in and about health, and it has to do with empowering the individual to manage their health and their health data. So, how does that work? So, last year they released this, uh, this new functionality within the health app uh, that's available on iOS that uh, makes it, as they say, easier than ever for users to visualize and securely store their health records. So now patients can aggregate the records from multiple institutions alongside their patient-generated data, creating this more holistic view. 
So how do they do that? Well, they leverage standards. Specifically, they leverage the Argonaut profile of the fire standard, which has been implemented by many, many different institutions because the big uh, electronic medical records vendors and Epic and Cerner have built support for it. And inside this profile, the specification of fire is the requirement for using one codes to identify the observations uh, that are in it. So uh, let me show you how this actually works. So we'll flip over here to uh, an iOS. Can you see that? Yeah, that's pretty good. So we'll do that. And over in your health app, uh, going to the health records uh, section, you know, it talks about the health records and privacy. And what happens is it establishes a direct connection between the healthcare institution and this page portal and your device. It doesn't go to Apple at all. It's one to one from them to you. So let's get started. And uh, here I'm going to just use, so I don't have a sign in or anything, I'm going to use uh, data from one of their sample institutions. So sample institution B, okay, it's available, contains some stuff. I add my account and it's going to suck in whatever data was in my record from that institution. And you see here it's organized in a couple of different categories and I'll uh, pay attention to the laboratory results and here you see the actual result values uh, of a certain set of tests that I had stored at that institution. And so if I click on that, you'll see uh, you know, this individual result. And of course, from my perspective, there are two cool things. One is, there is the one code right there because that's what is being used to aggregate those tests across different institutions. In addition, if you're a real one uh, geek, you might notice or recognize that this is, in, in fact, our long common name, the, the, one of the labels that we give uh, to this observation. Uh, and then, uh, actually, what's cool, if you're an app developer, you scroll down here and you notice that they actually have sort of the source data. So that observation record is structured using Fire. And, uh, of course, you'll see inside there, you know, uh, way up here, this is, you know, the one code and so forth and the units of measure. Uh, but this opens the possibility for app developers to directly interact with this structured, standardized data to interpret, understand, and build whatever sort of innovative things uh, that you can do. So that, I think, is uh, very, very, very cool. All right. So in summary, I would say today, there are now hundreds of millions of patients around the world who have billions of discrete results that are stored in systems that are coded uh, with LONIC. So thank you, and as we like to say in one plan, uh, happy one.